uh, with our feature on sport knife addiction and social media. Uh, we'll be running a selection of other webinars over the coming months on the importance of sleep and well-being and general healthy habits. So we'd love to invite you all to put forward your topic that you'd like us to be discussing and we'll be inviting real uh, bodies to come and talk with us about it. We're really, really delighted to have Jessica Anderson here with us today, who is a member of the Gusto team, who's one of our sponsors at the moment. Jessica, we'd love to learn a little bit more about you. Hello everyone, it gives me great pleasure to be here today. Um, so I am the nutritionist at Gusto. Um, as some of you may know, Gusto is a recipe kit service whereby we deliver recipes, ingredients, so that you can cook lovely meals at home. Um, and I'm here today to talk to you about nutrition and children. So as well as uh, working as a nutritionist at Gusto, I also run my own practice. I specialise in working with families and with children and teenagers. Um, I've been working in that field for over nine years now. So I hope during this presentation, you will take the opportunity to ask questions and hopefully I will be able to answer them for you. So moving on, um, so what we're going to cover during this session and this morning is we're going to just look at general nut children's nutritional needs. Um, we're also going to look at, so what is a balanced diet? What does a balanced diet look like? Um, I'm then going to cover diet and behaviour, and what is the link between what you eat and, uh, and how you behave. Um, then I'm going to talk a little bit about gut health, um, immune health, allergies and food intolerances, which I know is a, is a huge topic at the moment and a big concern for many parents. Um, then I'm going to cover a little bit on obesity and weight issues, um, problems that arise with children's eating habits, and how do you communicate this to your child? So we'll have a bit of a conversation around that. And then hopefully at the end, there will be an opportunity as well for more questions. So I think we've got some polls as well, um, which we'll be interjecting with too. For those of you as well who aren't familiar with how webinars work, you don't have to put anything in front of your camera. We can't see you, you're not being videoed but you can interact with us directly on the chat and Jessica will be more than happy to answer all of your questions. Absolutely. So, the first poll then is just looking at uh, the ages of your children, um, which I think is it's a, good, it's a good question to have since uh, nutritional needs vary a lot depending on how old your children are as well, so that's something to, to consider. So I'm just looking, looking at the answers. So we've got loads and loads of results flooding in. So we're going to give you five seconds now to answer this question. Okay, so it looks like a large percentage of you, 54% of you, have got children who are in primary at primary school age. So that's very useful. Very helpful to know that. And I think we've got one other question coming up. So next question is that how do you rate your nutrition knowledge? And there's some options there. Um, so if you could answer those, that would be great. And then there's one more question, which is how important is it to you what your children eat with a few options there as well. So I'll give you a couple of, or a minute or so to answer those. Were you always very interested in child nutrition, Jessica? Absolutely. Having three children of my own, um, it was definitely something that I was interested in. And also my grandmother, who is Swedish, was actually a headmistress at a school in Sweden, which is quite unusual mm -hmm. at that time. And nutrition was uh, very important to her. So she was a big influence 
in my life in terms of nutrition, but also cooking as well. She's a very good cook, and I love food, so it's nice to two things. Two things Absolutely. Together. So we're going to round up the time slot now for your vote. If everyone wants to submit their answer. Right, so looking at the how do you rate your nutrition knowledge, so we've got the larger percentage of you try to keep up, but there's so much advice, and I think that's absolutely true. I think we're just flooded with lots and lots of information. Sometimes it's very difficult to work out exactly what we should be doing. Um, and then in terms of how important it is to what the children eat, we've got I tried to do the right thing, but there's conflicting views, which ties in very well with the other question. And it's critical to get the meeting right early. So that's very, very helpful to know those things. So I think then we'll move on to looking at what is a balanced diet. So if we can go back to the presentation. Um, so right, so before we start, I just want to highlight some interesting facts. I thought this might be quite useful for everyone to, to know. So this is taken from some recent research that was done. It's actually in 2016. Um, it basically highlights that only 16% of children consumed five or more portions of fruit and vegetables a day. And if you look at the sort of trend that it is today, that's, that seems to be um, an ongoing problem, is that generally children do not eat enough fruit and vegetables. Um, the next fact is that in 2016 and 17, one in five children in year six um, and one in ten children in reception were classified as obese. And I'm sure you're all aware of the fact that we are in a sort of obesity epidemic at the moment, um, which is something that is being addressed on a sort of government, government level. And that's something we'll talk about further on in the talk. And that 5 to 8 percent of children in the UK suffer from a food allergy. Now that's specifically a food allergy, not actually a food intolerance. I think that's quite, quite an alarming number of children. And that the number of type 2 diabetes I've noticed among children in the UK continues to rise. And it's particularly prevalent among girls. Um, and uh, most of the um, time, or in fact we know for a fact, that uh, type 2 diabetes is very much connected to, to diet. So there's a lot of work to be done there in terms of um, trying to manage or trying to reduce the um, prevalence of type 2 diabetes. Jessica, can I just ask, do you have any advice for parents who have very, very fussy eight-year-olds? Uh, yes, I certainly do. Um, so I think as we go through this presentation, I'm going to talk, touch upon that a little bit about what to do with fussy eaters. But I think that the best thing that one can do is try to engage your children as much as possible in cooking, for example. Um, certainly things like trying to sort of create a positive relationship with food. So eating together at the table, getting them interested in, in food, taking them when you can, maybe at weekends to food markets, for example, um, trying to get them to, to try new things, but of course never forcing your child to eat, but just really trying to get them interested in foods. Always try to reintroduce foods several times so if they don't like it the first time. Don't give up there, just keep keep reintroducing, reintroducing, mm -hmm. and you'll probably find eventually that they will actually like the food. Um, but I think cooking with your children is really um, a very good way to get them interested in, in foods and, and getting them to expand their sort of repertoire of foods that they, that they will eat. Um, but I think not to be too anxious about it because I think that anxiety very often rubs off on a child. They can they pick up on that and that can often actually make the situation worse. So try to be quite relaxed about it and not show that you're worrying too much about, about their eating habits and the fact that perhaps they won't eat lots of, lots of foods. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so if we if we look at the sort of nutritional needs for children, this is a it's very generic, and I'm sure a lot of you have seen this. The eat well plate, um, but I think it's quite a good guideline. Um, obviously, nutritional needs for children will vary enormously. Um, but if you just look at the, this is really a representation of the um, different proportions of, of the food groups. So really what it demonstrates is if you look at the child's diet, that you want at least a third of their diet to be made up of fruit and vegetables. Um, you want about a third of their diet, so that's 30% of their diet to be made up of uh, carbohydrate foods. And that's preferably the whole grain carbohydrates. So when I say whole grain, that's the complex carbohydrate, so things like wholemeal bread, brown rice, wholemeal pasta, those types of carbohydrates. And it also includes root vegetables, so potatoes would fall under there as well, and parsnips. And then you want about so close to about 25% of the diet to be milk and dairy foods, and then about 25% of the diet to be protein foods, which is your meat and fish or other protein alternatives. And then a small percentage should be foods containing fat um, and sugar as well. But the important thing is the types of fats, and that we're going to talk about in a bit more detail further on. So if you look at the different groups, and the reason why we need to have these different groups, and I'm sure most of you probably know this already, but protein is essential for growth and repair and for maintenance. And your carbohydrates, particularly in children, are a very important source of energy. So if you have a very, very active child who's doing a lot of exercise, then their, protein, their carbohydrate needs may be slightly more than a child who is perhaps not so active. And then fats are very, very important in the diet, particularly your unsaturated fats. So these are the essential fats, which you primarily find in things like oily fish and nuts and seeds. And they are essential for, basically, for the health of the cells in your body. You need to have these really uh, important fats. Then dairy, which is your main source of calcium, which is essential for healthy bones and teeth. And then fruits and vegetables are your main source of vitamins and minerals. So ideally, you want your child to be having at least five portions of vegetables um, and fruit a day. And what I uh, is generally recommended is two portions of fruit and three portions of vegetables. Do you have any advice? on how to uh, get more omega-3 into your child's diet if they just won't eat fish? Yes, I do. And it is a tricky one because lots of children don't like fish, and particularly oily fish. Mm -hmm. So your main source then for omega-3 is going to be seeds. So things like pumpkin seeds, sunflower seeds, and actually walnuts are a very good source of omega-3 as well. So what I recommend is you can buy pumpkin seeds and you can grind them. So if your child doesn't like pumpkin seeds, but actually find surprisingly lots of children really like mm -hmm. seeds and they make quite a good snack. So a piece of fruit with a handful of seeds makes a very good snack. Okay. But what you can also do is you can grind them and if you're giving your child, say, cereal, for example, if you make them porridge, you can put them in, add them into the porridge. Mm -hmm. Or if you make a smoothie, then you can add things like pumpkin seeds and if you buy, buy the ready ground ones, then they, they don't necessarily give that sort of texture mm -hmm. um, that some children can be a little bit fussy about. But it is really important to try to encourage them to, if you can, eat the seeds um, whole because it's good in terms of their digestion as well. It's also a good source of fibre. But definitely grinding them and adding them to things like cereals and smoothies is, is a really good way of it. I wouldn't have thought that seeds would have been the way forward in terms of omega 3. Yeah, absolutely. And flax seeds, you can buy flax seeds. But these seeds can be quite expensive. So um, my sort of best advice really is if you go to stores like Tesco, for example, mm -hmm. you can actually buy the very reasonable price, reasonable price. You can get really good bags of mixed seeds. You don't necessarily have to go to a health food shop or a specialist shop. They are very readily available now as well. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, so I put this slide up here, which is a, an example of a typical day's menu. And the reason why I put this up here is because um, I quite often, when I see parents with children, I, I quite often will look at their food diaries. And this is quite typical. It's a typical day that I would see whereby a child has um, started with breakfast being something like a bowl of special K um, with milk. And then their lunch might be something like a pizza with a fruit yogurt. 
um, and quite often they'll have one of those sort of um, sort of drinks that come in those little pouches, um, and then snacks. I very often see parents keeping their children things like Kellogg's cereal bars or a bag of crisps, um, and then dinner. A popular dinner is quite often something like pasta with um, tomato sauce and then they might have a dessert which might be a bowl of ice cream and I am quite I'm quite surprised at how often I see children um, who drink some things like cans of coke or other um, high of sugar drinks and then an even snack might be something like a Kit Kat so this is really this is quite extreme a lot of you might think but this is something that I quite commonly see and what I just want to point out about this type of diet is that if you look at the nutritional value of it, you will see that it's, it's very low in protein. In fact, there's almost no protein there at all. Um, probably most amount of protein is, is going to be in the ice cream or in the milk um, and, in, and in the yogurt. And you also see that it's quite high in sugar. So something like those Capri fruit drinks tend to be really high in sugar. Some of them can have up to teaspoon, four teaspoons of sugar. Um, and also salt um, is a concern as well. So something like crisps and um, a ready-made pizza can be quite high in salt. There is a um, distinct lack of um, fruit and vegetables, um, a reasonable level of calcium, so lots of calcium in the dairy, but also quite low in fiber. So I just wanted to sort of demonstrate um, what a typical day's diet can look like for, for a lot of children. And then moving on, we have an example of a good alternative diet. So how this could look like is um, so not that far off, really. But for breakfast, for example, trying to go for more of a low sugar um, cereal. So something like uh, Weetabix, for example, or porridge oats, which are both very low sugar cereals. And perhaps introducing some fruit into that and then going for a fresh fruit juice which I think is best so slightly diluted because even with a fresh orange juice it's still quite high in sugar and then a snack trying to introduce something like as I was saying earlier about fruit with some mixed seeds or if your child's not allergic to nuts they can have nuts and then lunch something like a whole meal sandwich with a protein in it so it could be chicken or ham or cheese um, with some salad and then preferably rather than buying a fruit yogurt trying to go for something like a plain yogurt and adding in some fruit and then drinking water rather than um, one of the sugary drinks and then sna a snack in the afternoon so an example here is a note cake with some nut butter or hummus or again you could have a small piece of cheese and then dinner um, with pasta trying to go for a wholemeal pasta with something like a bolognese sauce and and then preferably a vegetable so you can see that's a um, an example which is more of a well-balanced uh, day in terms of meals um, lots of protein a good variety of fruit and vegetables quite low in saturated fat plenty of calcium and also high in fiber so that's just really to demonstrate what a, a good balanced diet could look like for your child Jessica, I've got some really interesting questions coming through. And just so everyone at home knows, please, please do send your questions in to us. Um, we've had one of our parents wanting to know if fruit juices are good for their children because they thought yeah, there is a lot of sugar in them. So it is true that in natural fruit juices, there is a lot of sugar. And I think the more that you can encourage your children to drink water, the better. So get them to eat the real fruit, the, the, the actual fruit itself, because eating the fruit itself, you get more fibre that way. And also the process of chewing as well actually stimulates digestive enzymes. So you're actually getting your digestion to work. You've got the fibre, you've got still the vitamins and minerals, mm -hmm. whereby if you're actually drinking the fruit juice, it's more concentrated. Um, you tend to have a lot more fruit than you would eat in mm -hmm. a glass of fruit juice. So it's definitely better to drink water. Mm -hmm. If you struggle with um, your children drinking water, because lots of children are quite resistant to drink water, to drinking water on its own, you can always squeeze in a little bit of fruit juice mm -hmm. rather than having a whole glass of concentrated fruit juice. Okay. And what would you say are the most popular recipes for children to cook themselves? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> That's a very good question. Um, I'd say the most popular recipes to cook themselves are things like pizza, so make your own pizza. You don't necessarily have to use, I mean, you can make a pizza, you can be a bit creative with your pizza, so you can use, you can make your own pizza base and use a whole meal um, flour if you want, but if you don't have time to make your own pizza base, then by all means use um, a ready made pizza base mm -hmm. and then get your child to put their own toppings on. And so I find that children absolutely love doing that. Um, other things that children like doing is you can get them to make racks, for example. So um, you can buy wholemeal racks and then you can put, get them to put their own fillings inside so they can chop up vegetables, they can so things like strips of pepper, they can add bits of um, protein, so it could be chicken or if they're vegetarian, they could put in, add in some hummus, that kind of thing. So I find children really enjoy doing that. Um, you can even get your child to, if you're making something like a bolognese, which tends to be quite popular with children, there's no reason why you can't introduce your children to sort of chopping up vegetables, so putting those into a bolognese, so something like, not necessarily onion, but maybe they could just chop up some um, carrots or peppers, that type of thing. So I find those generally uh, tend to work quite well. I also often get children to help with making things like a risotto, mm -hmm. so just getting them to stir the rice, and they just always find that quite interesting as well, because seeing how the rice kind of cooks as they're, as they're stirring it, and then they can sort of throw in their, what vegetables they want um, at the end. Um, also things like pancakes, mm -hmm. you can do pancakes and put some good toppings, it can be savoury pancakes, that type of thing. So I think the more you engage your child in, in cooking, the better. And obviously baking is, is a very good way mm -hmm. to get children involved. Um, you can make all sorts of healthy versions of cakes and biscuits. And there's lots and lots of resources on websites um, where they can also, if you're using of course, a Gusto box where you get the full kit where all the recipes are, you've got all the ingredients measured out, there's no reason why you can't engage your children in, in making the recipes that arrive, you can get them to choose what recipes they want to make, yeah. um, that type of thing. As I'm sure you're aware, and we're all aware, most parents nowadays are working and busy, and of course, very, very conscious about being able to ensure their children are having enough fruit and veg. In terms of if you're cutting up fruits and vegetables, can you store it and serve it later? Will it lose any nutritional value? What's no, ab absolutely not. And um, this is something I recommend a lot with parents is to try to plan ahead as much as possible. So think about the week ahead, what's what's coming up, um, bulk cooking at the weekends, um, but also definitely things like preparing fruit and vegetables. So you can get some really good Tupperware pots if you don't like plastic. Lots of parents are a bit reluctant to store food in plastic containers. If you go on online, you'll see that there's a huge range of really good glass storage containers that you can keep in the fridge. You can chop up things like carrot sticks, um, pepper sticks, cucumber sticks, celery sticks, those types of things. Keep them stored in the fridge so that when your child comes home and they're starving hungry, you can get those out, lay them out on a platter, put, put out some things like dips and um, other things to go, to go with those. So it could be cream cheese, could be some little slices of cheese. Um, so certainly, I think preparing, planning, having things ready, readily, uh, ready, available, um, is a really good way to sort of take the stress out of out of cooking. But also, don't underestimate um, how what you can do with store cup ingredients. So what I say to parents is to stock up on things that you can keep in the cupboard where you can create a very quick meal. So things like tins of tuna, tins of sweet corn, um, wraps, whole grain pasta, um, potato, that kind of thing. So if you get home, you don't have much time, you can actually put together a really quick meal by cooking up some tinned tomatoes, adding some tuna, putting in some sweet corn, um, and then you could just quickly cook up a vegetable to have on the side. So lots and lots of opportunities there to work with the store cupboard ingredients. And if you if you like, I could actually send you some some ideas for some quick quick recipes and things that maybe parents could 
Um, yeah, absolutely. We'll be sharing out. everything um, from this webinar with everyone who's attended today. But on that note, I think we're going to move into another poll on breakfast. So this one is, what do your kids typically eat for breakfast? So our options are no breakfast at all, cereal, baked beans on toast, or open toast, a fruit smoothie, or other. So we'll just give one or oh. So we're going to do this pretty quickly. So I'll count down from five, four, three, two, one. So that's that's very interesting. So 45% of you say that um, your children have cereal for breakfast. So that that's really really interesting. So um, I, that then I think is a good. Let's move on to the next slide. So, I think, uh, yes. Yeah. So, talking about breakfast. So, breakfast is a really, really important meal. And quite often I see children don't have breakfast, or perhaps they might grab something on their way to school, which might be something quite unhealthy, like a bag of crisps or a chocolate bar. So I really urge parents to, to think about breakfast and take the time to ensure that your children do have a good breakfast. And there is absolutely nothing wrong with cereal in the morning. Um, it's, it's a good breakfast, it's quick and um, very easy to, to give. But what I would encourage parents to do is to think about the choice of cereal that you give your children, because some cereals can have an alarming amount of sugar in. So what you want to try to think about is when you buy your cereal, try to aim for um, cereals which has got three grams or less of sugar per 100 grams. So try to avoid cereals like things like Frosties, um, one for of sugar coated, so honey coated, Cheerios, those types of cereals, because the problem with those is that they are very high in sugar. So what happens is that when your children eat those types of cereals, which also don't have very much protein in, then they'll get a sort of spike in their, in their blood sugar, so they'll feel satisfied after they've eaten it. But the risk is that they'll then get this sort of drop in their energy levels about half an hour after they've eaten it. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about blood sugar further on. So my advice is if you're going to give your child cereal, go for a low sugar one, and even better, try to add some sort of protein to it so you may consider adding something like some pumpkin seeds, um, or you could add some Greek yogurt. So Greek yogurt is a fantastic option to add to a cereal because that's high in protein. It's much higher than, in protein than a normal yogurt. Um, or if your child isn't allergic to nuts, then you could add a few chopped nuts as well. So in terms of the low sugar cereals, as I mentioned before, wheat mix and porridge are really good options for that. So this is just a suggestion here. You've got um, things like uh, wholemeal, toast with a board or poached egg, um, toast with nut butter is also good, things like ham and egg with toast, or if you're really in a hurry or you struggle to get your child to eat breakfast, you can consider making them a smoothie, which wouldn't necessarily be the ideal option, but if you are going to make a smoothie, then try to add in some protein. So again, as I mentioned earlier, something like some pumpkin seeds would be a really good option. So, so then moving on, I want to, since we're talking about um, good sort of uh, snacks and breakfast, and I want to talk a little bit about um, packed lunch. So what is the ideal packed lunch? So what you need to be thinking about when you're putting together a packed lunch is to make sure that you combine those different food groups. So looking at having a combination of the starchy carbohydrates, um, your protein and your fruit and vegetables, and also some dairy, so that your child is having a good balanced packed lunch. So there's absolutely nothing wrong with your child having a sandwich, which is an easy thing to make. And there are lots of different uh, fillings that you can put into a sandwich. But try, if you can, to go for wholemeal bread, because that way you're ensuring that your child is getting a good complex carbohydrate. And then making sure that you include, again, the protein, which can be ham or cheese or egg. Um, if you're a vegan, then you can use something like hummus. And then to add a bit of salad to that as well. 
The other thing you can make is a rack. So racks are great because you can put lots of different types of fillings in there. And then if you want to give it a pudding, then I would recommend something like a, a Greek yogurt, again, which is high in protein, and then add some fruit to that. Or you can make up salads, so using things like wholemeal pasta as a base, and then into that you can put things like some chopped peppers or other vegetables, um, bits of mozzarella, that type of thing. So these are really good options for, for packed lunches. So I don't, if anyone's got any questions since we're on the subject of packed lunch, if they want to ask anything, then, then please do. But the main thing is to follow that rule of having the different food routes and trying to avoid having too much sugary foods in, in your packed lunch. And then putting in a, a bottle of water as well. I know a lot of schools now have actually banned fizzy drinks um, or sort of soft drinks um, at, in their packed lunches. So trying to get your children to, to drink water with their lunch as well. Jessica, I do actually have a question for you. Is um, Greek style yogurt the same as Greek yogurt? Um, it's not the same. You'll find that the Greek yogurt generally have got more protein in. So the difference is if you compare like for like if you looked at a, a Greek yogurt compared to a um, normal natural yogurt, which is also perfectly acceptable, mm -hmm. by the way. There's nothing wrong with a natural yogurt either. But a Greek yogurt has about 9.6 grams of protein in mm -hmm. um, per 100 gram, whereas a natural yogurt tends to be around 6. Okay. So it's just a very good way to get your child to have to increase their, their protein. And it tends to be more filling. Mm -hmm. It's the same with adults as well. Mm -hmm. But you can also go for the natural yogurt. But the Greek style is not the same as the actual mm -hmm. Greek yogurt. I think as well, um, you know, we're all trying to be more environmentally friendly and conscious. Do you have any tips on making your pet lunch more environmentally friendly? Um, well, I think the thing I would suggest is to buy, try to buy in bulk so you're not buying lots of little small packets of mm -hmm. things. And then just getting a really good lunch box that is reusable. Mm -hmm. that, um, and using containers that, again, that you can keep reusing. Yeah. Um, again, some parents are not too happy about using too much plastic. Mm -hmm. um, so um, it's difficult with children. You don't really want to be getting them to be taking sort of heavy glass pots. But if you go online, you can find that there are some very good types of plastic that um, are sort of really solid and um, they don't, because um, the problem with plastic is that when it gets hot, Mm -hmm. um, it, or when it gets warm, it sort of leaks, the, they're called um, many sort of toxic um, estrogens that can sort of go into the, into the food. It's in very small amounts, but parents do worry about that. Of so, so if you are concerned about that, then you can use, of course you can use other, other means to wrap your food, you can use foil and that kind mm -hmm. of thing. But I think, you know, try, try to buy in bulk and not sort of those little packets. So with yogurt, for example, buy a big pot of yogurt and then portions out into a little container rather than buying sort of individual mm -hmm. individual pots. One of our parents would actually like to know what your thoughts are on fermented foods, such as miso, um, for helping with weight and Yeah, I think I'm going to talk about this in gut health. Um, definitely fermented foods, if you can get your children to like fermented foods, that's fantastic. It's very good for the gut, it encourages more of the good bacteria in the gut. So things like pickled foods, kimchi, um, those types of foods, miso is, is good. But you have to be aware of the fact that tofu and miso is um, a potential allergen, so mm -hmm. just be mindful of that. But absolutely tofu is a very good protein food. Uh, it's also got lots of calcium in it. So here's another question. So I want you to, to look at these three things. Um, which of the three has got the most amount of sugar in it? Is it the Activia yogurt? Is it the Coca-Cola? Or is it the smoothie? So I'll give you a minute to, to answer that. We I asked this question around the office and not many people got it right. <laughs> <laughs> So do you want to do your five second countdown? <laughs> five, four, three, two, one. <laughs> Submit. <laughs> right, so Coca-Cola, 30%, 20%. 
20% of the yogurt pot. Okay, and the answer is, in fact, come to the slide, you'll probably all be surprised to find that the one with the most amount of sugar in it is, in fact, the smoothie. Um, so the smoothie, the innocent smoothie, has got the equivalent of six and a half teaspoons of sugar in it. Um, Coca-Cola has got sort of around 6.2 teaspoons, and one Activa has got three teaspoons of sugar. So this is my concern about a lot of the fruit yogurts that you buy. They do tend to be very high in sugar. So my advice is to try to make your own or put together your own nice fruit yogurt rather than buying one that um, that is actually uh, has already got the, the fruit added. There are sorts of low sugar yogurts on the market, but I don't really recommend the ones that have got the sweetener in. I think it's better to, to try to add the fruit if you can, rather than buying ones that have got artificial sweetener. So I don't know if anyone's got any questions around that, but you can see a lot of drinks um, are very high in sugar. And even things like San Pellegrino and Ribena, alarmingly, a bottle of Ribena, which a lot of parents think is reasonably healthy, but one of the sort of normal bottles that you buy has actually got about 11 teaspoons of sugar in it. So be very, very mindful about um, drinks and things like fruit yogurts and things. And I urge parents to always try to look at the label, familiarize yourself with the label, um, and just get into the habit of, of reading labels when you buy those types of foods. I think we're very easily seduced into buying snacks and cereals and drinks that give a message which um, appears very healthy, but actually when you look at the ingredients, particularly with some of these cereal bars and things like granola, you find that they're actually really high in sugar. Jessica, Natasha would actually like to know how she can make healthy cereal bars and what sort of healthy cereal bars she can make at home. So cereal bars are actually really easy to make. So you can use, um, so if you get oats, for example, I think the best thing is probably I can give you some, I can give you a recipe for a really good cereal bar. But um, using oats and what you do is you mix them, you can use um, something like linseed oil, you can add a bit of honey, mm -hmm. um, mix those together, you can add a little bit of um, dry fruit or even fresh, fresh blueberries. Mm -hmm. um, so you mix it all together so you get consistency so that it, it sort of makes quite a thick mix and you press it down into a baking tray and then you put them in the oven for about 20 minutes. But in order to get the right proportions, I'd have to, I'd have to send you the, the recipe for that. The other thing I make a lot when I get parents to make, and I do a lot of cooking sessions with parents, is make protein balls, and they are fantastic mm -hmm. um, because you can make them, they last for a week in the fridge. So what you do is you basically put in a blender, a combination, you can use raw cocoa powder, mm -hmm. tahini, you can put an avocado in, um, and you blend them together, you can put in a few dates, and then you can make these with your children, you can get them, roll them up in balls, you can coat them in some desiccated coconut mm -hmm. or sesame seeds and store them in the fridge and they're a fantastic thing to bring to school. Lots of schools won't allow nuts, but you can make them without nuts. So again, I have a lot of good mm -hmm. recipes for protein balls that you can make for that. Again, um, Natasha says that her daughter eats a lot of fresh fruit, but how good or bad is that for acidity in her teeth? Um, I think it's fine to eat. I mean, I recommend two portions a day, but I, I think as long as they're cleaning their teeth properly, fruit juice, eating fruit fresh is better than drinking fruit juice in terms of the teeth, because when you drink juice, particularly if you're drinking it in a bottle, it tends to stay around the teeth, mm -hmm. um, whereas when you're sort of chewing the fruit, it tends not to sort of linger around on the teeth as much. But I think if you make sure the children are brushing their teeth properly, then it, it shouldn't, be, shouldn't be a problem. So, next question is, how can I encourage my child to make sensible choices? So, this is the kind of question I get asked a lot by parents. It's very difficult to have problems with them. children with peer pressure, um, seeing what their friends are doing, um, and really, that's probably the biggest issue that we find with, with children. And also, children are um, or often can be quite fussy about the foods that they eat. So, my recommendation, if we move on to the next slide on how we can get children to make sensible choices. Is 
Dann das rechne ich mir mit dem X2. Well, before we move on to the next, I think we've got the technical issue here. Um, so, how you can encourage your, your child to make sensible choices is, first of all, as I was saying earlier, I think to try and get your child interested in food and cooking as early as possible is, is sorry, it's way through. Right. So, it's to introduce your child to healthy eating as, as early as you possibly can. So, it's it's actually said that children um, develop their, their kind of, um, or, or actually, it's really in the first years of their life that they develop their sort of eating habits. Um, and so, as soon as you can, as soon as your child starts having solids, try to introduce them to a healthy diet. And I think there's nothing better than, than, I mean, you as a parent are the role model for your child. So the more you do at home, the more that will influence your child in terms of eating healthily. So what I say to parents is try to cook with your children as much as you can and really engage them in, in healthy eating and also not keeping unhealthy foods at home. So. I was quite strict with my children in that I just didn't have unhealthy foods at home. That doesn't mean that I didn't ever sort of, they weren't allowed to have treats and we didn't sort of have things like cakes and celebrate birthdays and have a cake and that type of thing and, and sit in front of a movie and you know we might have had sort of the odd bag of crisps. But I just wasn't in the habit of keeping unhealthy options at home. So they didn't have a choice when it came to when I gave them, for example, pasta, I always gave them wholemeal pasta. Um, I didn't generally sort of keep things like biscuits at home and crisps at home unless we were sort of doing something special. So just don't have those things around and then and then they won't they won't have the choice basically. Um, I think the other thing is not to make different meals for children. I I have a lot of parents who some parents have two or three children and sometimes they're making two or three different meals because they have one child that won't eat this and not another child that won't eat that. So what I say to parents is just make the food, put it on the table, and don't give them the option. If they don't want to eat it, then my suggestion is you take it away from them. Don't negotiate too much with them. Um, I know it sounds very harsh, but the more you get into a negotiation with your child, the more difficult it becomes in the long term. So and the other thing I say to parents is don't get sort of anxious about it. Just put the food in front of them. And if they don't want to eat it, then just don't draw too much attention to the fact that they're, they're not eating it. Don't get into a battle with them about it. Just sort of take it away from them. Or what you might say to them is you might negotiate with them in terms of just getting them to try something. And if they try it and they don't like it, at least they've actually made the effort, effort to try it. But I think you'll find if you persist with that, you'll find that eventually that they will start to start to eat the food. And if they're hungry enough, then they, they will certainly start to eat it. Um, the other thing you can think about is trying to um, have finger food, try to, to use a lot of finger food. So if you've got a young child, often children sort of like to play around with the food a bit themselves. They like to have the option of actually picking it up with their hands. So I think finger food is a, is a really good way to get younger children to, to eat. Um, also, don't use food as a treat. So if your child has done well with their meal, and perhaps they've eaten the food that, they're not, that they don't normally eat, then I do think it's quite good to have a reward um, system. So you might put a chart up and, and you might give them a star. But I wouldn't say to a child, um, if you do your homework, then you can have um, I'm going to give you a bag of crisps, or um, if you um, don't make a fuss at bedtime, then um, I'll give you another treat, for example. So just don't use food as a treat. The other thing I would say as well is try and eat together as much as you can. So quite often uh, children will eat on their own, so they might have their dinner by themselves after school. And I think in order for them to develop a healthy relationship with you, I think it's really important that they that you eat together and that they actually are 
and they're able to sort of use that time as well to, to talk to you um, to tell you a little bit about your day. So you can sort of start a conversation. So the conversation is not necessarily focused on food, but it's more around what they've been doing and, and how they felt about their day. The other thing I'd say is try to avoid empty uh, calorie snacks. And I see this a lot with parents, is that a child finishes school, they're incredibly hungry after school, and they'll often give them a snack which is quite filling. Um, it's, perhaps it could be something like, um, just an example, a, a bag of crisps or a Kit Kat. And then what happens is, inevitably, they're not hungry enough when it comes to meal times. So try to avoid giving your child an empty snack, uh, an empty calorie snack, I call it, which is a high sugar snack. Try to give them something which is quite a sensible type of snack. So it might be something like, um, you might give them, I don't know, a good example would be something like um, an oat cake, for example, which might have some nut butter on or a bit of hummus and some vegetable sticks. Because then you'll find that that would just sustain them enough until dinner time and then by, by the time they have dinner, they should be hungry enough that they'll, that they'll want, to, want to eat. So that's just sort of some, um, some tips. When it comes to peer pressure, I think you just have to be really persistent at home with your own beliefs when it comes to healthy eating and speak to your child about healthy eating. You can't control completely what your children are having away from school. So if they're at a friend's house and and they're eating something which is unhealthy. I think that that's something that you just have to have to accept. I think the more you can do at home, the better. And if they're not going for the healthy options when they're not at home, I don't see that as being such a big problem. So I think it's just really trying to instill in them as much as you can um, your own sort of beliefs around healthy eating and explain to them you know, why you want them to eat healthy at home and what they do outside of home. Um, that you can't control is not really such an issue. So it's kind of about balance at the end of the day, that they are having those um, unhealthy options there, that's okay, as long as they're getting what they need when they're at home. So Susan said that her children watch a lot of cooking programs, um, particularly anything around baking. Do you have any role model shows that you would recommend? Um, obviously not health kitchen. <laughs> Um, that's a that's a tricky one because um, I think sort of I mean I think most a lot of the cooking I mean I think Jamie Oliver is probably a very good example because he makes cooking fun um, and I think he's 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 quite good at demonstrating sort of healthy options um, so I'd say probably I would go for um, a program like that. Um, Saturday Kitchen is tend to be sort of more sort of chefy, so you, you often get sort of more complicated recipes. But I, I think in terms of children, uh, young children or teenagers who are interested in cooking, I'd say probably Jamie Oliver is, is, is quite a good option when it when it comes to that. Um, it's difficult to say because um, I I don't myself watch a huge amount of <laughs> cooking books, but actually on YouTube there's quite a lot of quite good cooking programs or sort of cooking mm -hmm. uh, YouTube channels. Um, so if you search um, on there sort of children healthy recipes on YouTube, you'd be surprised how many recipes actually come up and quite a lot of quite good demos on there. So I think to researching and having a look at that would be a really good option. Absolutely. So it'd be really interesting to know if everyone at home notices a change in their children's behaviour depending on the food that they've eaten. So yes, that's a good question. So the questions are, or the answers are, uh, the options is no, they don't notice a change in behaviour, or yes they do, um, or occasionally, or they haven't really thought about it. Five, four, <laughs> three, two, one. This will be an interesting one to see. Yes. Okay. Good. I'm very. I'm glad to see that. That most people uh, notice that there is um, a change in their children's behaviour depending on what they eat. And I think this is a really, really important one for food and mood because there's a definite correlation between not just for children but also with adults, but we do tend to notice it 
more with children that there is a, a real correlation between what you eat and how you feel. So there is a lot you can do um, with a child's diet to, to really help um, to some degree support their behaviour. Because your brain is very sensitive to chemical changes and particularly when it comes to, to glucose. And this is where we have this whole discussion around the blood sugar, which I touched upon earlier. So the kind of things that we see in children, um, which can definitely be influenced by, by diet, is things like ADHD and hyperactivity, um, mood swings, difficulty in concentration, learning difficulties, um, problems with sleeping, low energy, sweet cravings, and anxiety. So those are all sort of common behaviours that we see in children. Um, and the possible causes of that which is very much influenced by diet, is um, poor blood sugar balance, lack of nutrients, too many additives, um, allergies and food intolerances. But I can say with all honesty that um, blood sugar is probably one of the key factors when it comes to um, children's behaviour. So I really want to um, help everyone to understand about blood sugar balance. So if we can move on to the, the next slide. Just to um, add in, Natasha said that her three-year-old daughter spins around after a sip of cake. Right, yes, that's quite, that's quite common. And some children, when they have chocolate, they can get a real kind of manic episode or any real sort of fine sugar, sugar drink or something that's got a lot of additives in it. For everyone sitting at home, just to feedback on cooking shows, Zelia very kindly recommends Ramsey's Daughter on CBC. Oh, fantastic. Well, that's brilliant. That just shows how little children's television I actually work. Okay, so moving on. Um, so just, we haven't got a huge amount of time left now, so I'm just going to skim through the next few slides quite quickly. But just on the diet and behaviour, um, just to demonstrate really that um, lack of nutrients is very important when it comes to mood. So really thinking about uh, making sure your children get plenty of omega-3s and omega-6, but particularly the omega-3s, which are the oily fish and the nuts and seeds. So there's been a lot of research to show that lack of omega-3s um, has a, a direct impact on brain function, particularly with children. Um, and, uh, and also to think about blood sugar balance. So I'm not going to talk sort of more about this particular slide because you will have a copy of those. But if you look through these, then it will um, give you that uh, well, more detailed information. So on the next, just thinking about blood sugar balance as a whole, um, what you want to think about is when, you're, when you eat your food, it gets converted into glucose. And we're completely glucose dependent, so our brain is glucose dependent. So when our glucose levels are very high, um, that's when we tend to get this real surge of energy, and that's often when we see a sort of episode of hyperactivity in children, is when you get that massive surge of, of glucose into the blood. So when your glucose levels are very low, that's when you tend to feel very tired and sluggish when you lose concentration. Um, and in some children, you actually see they become very emotional when their blood sugars are very low. So what you want to do with your children is to try to focus on stabilising their blood sugar throughout the day. And that will help with concentration, that will help give them more energy, um, and it will also help their mood as well. So the way to do that is to make sure that they have regular meals and snacks, that they're not having too much sugary food, because that just spikes the, the blood sugar, that they're always having protein with every meal, because protein slows down the release of sugar into the blood. Um, and that you avoid too many uh, processed foods because processed foods are often quite high in sugar. Um, and that they also, um, as well as this, that they drink plenty of fluids as well because sometimes um, the fluid in itself can actually help to increase energy levels. So often if you're very dehydrated, that can also uh, reduce your energy levels and that can impact on your blood sugar. So here you'll see in the slide there's a good demonstration of blood sugar and a bit of an explanation as well. So blood sugar and mood go very closely together. So just one other question is, um, should your children snack during the day? Um, so if, rather than running a poll, I'm just going to say, yes, your children should snack during the day. 
And the reason for that is because it's, again, it's all to do with blood sugar maintenance. You don't want to be having large gaps when your children don't have anything to eat because that tends to be when they get cravings or, again, low energy. So you want to think about giving your child a snack. So as soon as they get back from school, consider um, having healthy snacks around. So here are just some examples of good snack options for your child. Um, and uh, so they're listed here. So, um, so then my next slide, sorry, we're going through this one quickly because we've only got actually three minutes left <laughs> of our presentation. Um, so here's just a, a some around immune health. So looking at um, supporting the immune system. Um, and here I've just listed some key uh, nutrients that you need to include in your children's diet. Um, but I would say that in terms of your immune system, what you really want to think about is that you'll make sure that your child is getting a good, well-balanced diet. And if they are, then ideally they should be getting the vitamins and minerals that they need. Um, so I think we'll go on to that just uh, sources of omega-3. Um, then here is the question around food allergies. And um, I just wanted to demonstrate that 6% of children at the moment currently suffer from a food allergy, which is an alarming number. And there is really no conclusive reason as to why food allergies are so much on the increase. But there is a lot of uh, research being done and a lot of theories. And one of the theories is around gut health, that our children's gut health is not as good as it used to be. And that's because we're consuming more refined carbohydrates and sugars, which is bad for the gut bacteria, but also that um, the other thing is that children are taking more antibiotics than they used to. And plus, we are much cleaner than we used to be. So there's a lot of uh, uh, discussions around gut health and the immune system and, and allergies and food intolerances. So you will see that I have actually put a slide up here around gut health, which really gives advice as to what you can do to help improve your child's gut. So I would urge all parents to think about Jordan's gut and what they can do to, to improve it. And here's some, some really good tips um, around that. Then uh, obesity and weight management. Um, here I've put up some uh, tips here on how you can talk to your child about their weight, um, what you can do to um, really, uh, in, a, in a sense, you don't want to make your child feel, if you are concerned about your child's weight, the last thing you want to do is to make them feel bad about their, their weight. So here I've sort of put up a few sort of tips as to how you can talk to them about it. Um, unfortunately, we don't have time to go into too much um, sort of in, uh, detail in terms of their diet, but I have at least here listed a few things that you can do um, in order to help um, to some degree to manage your child's weight. Um, and uh, you will see here that it's a lot of it is around eating a healthy diet, uh, reducing sugary foods, um, looking at uh, things like increasing exercise, that type of thing, um, introducing sort of healthy snacks and things so that they're not having lots of those empty calorie snacks that I talked about earlier. Um, so, and then the next one is around children's problems with children's eating habits, the types of problems that a lot of people encounter. So, you see a list there of the types of things that um, parents are often faced with. Um, we talked a little bit about picky eaters. Um, we also uh, talked about things like peer pressure, that type of thing. So the next slide here, I've got tips and ideas on how you can encourage um, good eating habits with your children. So again, I would urge you to sort of have a good look through through those. I'd also just like to thank everyone who attended today's webinar, and we love your suggestions for future webinars. And just to let everyone know that all the slides will be sent out, and our parents have a special gusto offer as well waiting for them. Absolutely. So thank you so much. I'm sorry we didn't have time to go into more detail on everything, um, but I hope you'll find the slides useful. And I will also send May some um, other bits and pieces of information that she can make available to you as well. So that's things that we talked about with the snacks, etc. So thank you so much. Um, it's been a great pleasure presenting this webinar on behalf of
Houston. And thank you for joining us. You're welcome.